CBS Radio presents the news. From Washington, here is Bob Pierpoint. Another larger Sputnik with a dog named Curly aboard is now whirling around the Earth 1,000 miles out in space. The Russians launched an 1,100-pound satellite late last night, and so far both Sputnik 2 and its canine passenger are reported doing well. The dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. Radio Moscow started broadcasting time schedules for its latest satellite a short while ago with the announcement that Sputnik 2 will pass over Washington, D.C. in just a few minutes from now. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, well-known associate director of the Smithsonian Observatory at Cambridge, Massachusetts, was asked if the half-ton weight of Sputnik 2 indicated the Russians might have a war rocket powerful enough to reach this continent from the Soviet Union. It certainly indicates they have the capabilities of launching an intercontinental ballistic missile, replied Dr. Hynek. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. Dr. John S. Reinhardt, also with the Smithsonian Observatory, commented after studying figures on the new Soviet satellite, I firmly believe the Russians could reach the moon in a few days. I believe we should go to the moon. I think every citizen of this country, as well as the members of the Congress, should consider the matter carefully. Every scientist, every engineer, every serviceman, every technician, contractor, and civil servant gives his personal pledge that this nation will move forward with a full speed of freedom in the exciting adventure of space. We go into space because whatever mankind must undertake, free men must fully share. On January 25, 1994, the Deep Space Program science experiment known as Clementine was launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Clementine was able to deliver more than 1.8 million digital images between February 26 and April 22, 1994. These images were quickly accessible to the general public on the World Wide Web. In 1994, President Clinton cited the Clementine mission as one of the major national achievements in aeronautics in space. This is a segment from the 2009 version of Moon Rising. At that time it featured the Clementine Lunar Image Browser 1.5 with instructions on how to find a moon anomaly. This is what it looked like before it was taken off the internet. Click on the desired resolution section and choose the one pixel equals one kilometer option. On the image size and pixels option, choose 768 by 768. You are now ready to see for yourself a huge object on the surface of the moon. On the moon map, you will easily see a dot on the top of this crater and on the lower left. Click on the black dot on top of the crater and the close-up image of this section appears in the browser. What you see is a huge object resting at the top of what is known as the Zeeman Crater. It appears to be a large machine or perhaps a large spaceship, but one thing is for certain, the contours of this huge object present qualities which lead to suggest an intelligent presence. You can clearly see that this image has been smudged over and blurred around most of the object so we cannot see the details. 
This little gem was brought to the attention of moon researchers around the world by Joseph P. Skipper on May 28, 2004. I decided to hire an image forensics expert to take this official image and see what other pertinent information can be gathered from it. Jim Horrocks, an image forensics expert who has worked with the Los Angeles Police Department, was sent various Clementine images and his findings were written in a report that he submitted to the production. First of all, the astounding measurements Jim made from the Zeeman Crater object reveal that this anomaly is 10 times the size of Los Angeles. 10 times the size! This in itself is an incredible detail about the size of this object. By using Adobe Photoshop and some of the filters available within the program, we were able to bring out more of the details that were lost due to the image tampering at the hands of the Department of Defense or whomever directs the Clementine Mission archives. This enormous object appears intelligent in its design and presents many features we associate with our technology here on Earth. In all of the enhancements of the Zeeman object made independently, I am left asking, is this Clementine image at Zeeman Crater the first extraterrestrial evidence successfully captured on film under a public funded program? Certainly the contours of this area in particular have compelled me to ask this question above all. We will never know the truth behind this image until the Department of Defense or those responsible for tampering with this photo release the image to the general public. The smudging used for the censoring of this object which was photographed in 1994 was not done with precision because you can see small parts of this incredible anomalous object. Unfortunately for moon researchers, the Zeeman crater is located on the far side of the moon. Whether it's still there or not, we will never know until this information is released to us. After I released the first version of Moon Rising in 2009, the Clementine web browser 1.5 where you could have visited and found these anomalies yourself was taken out. They replaced it with the new 2.0 version of the Clementine Lunar Image Browser. Moon Rising must have raised some eyebrows because those who had seen my film were beginning to visit the Image Browser 1.5 and seeing these anomalies for themselves. When you go to this new browser, you will now see the Zeeman Crater in all of its clarity. There is no object there anymore, and there is no smudging, blurring, or tampering of any kind near or within the crater. We have to ask ourselves, if there is nothing on the moon to suggest alien moon bases, strange structures, machines, and possibly advanced civilizations thriving there, then why is there evidence of the deliberate tampering of these and the many images we will present here in this film? While making Moon Rising in 2009, I had a scene where we would zoom from Earth to the moon. So I needed a 3D model of the moon, and I contacted some friends who work in special visual effects here in the studios, and ask them where I can go to get an accurate 3D model that's detailed and looks real. Everyone I talked to sent me to mapaplanet.com, which is on the USGS website. That's the United States Geological Survey website. Up until I went there, I was still under the impression that the moon is gray, black and white, because that's the way NASA and others have portrayed it for many years. When I hit mapaplanet.com, the Earth, Moon, Mars, and all the other planets were listed. I clicked on the moon thumbnail and it sends me to a page that has different photography samples of the moon. But what caught my eye was the one that says natural color. So I clicked on this and a whole new impression was put to me about the moon. First of all, I found the skin in full color of the moon that when wrapped around the 3D sphere in my modeling program called Cinema 4D, the moon came to life in its full natural color. I was totally overwhelmed. I started zooming into the moon's many areas and found some of the most incredible full color photography of the moon that none of us have ever seen before. I was compelled to download all the photos I could and in high resolution to use in my films. This footage shows you some of the most spectacular full color photography I downloaded from mapaplanet.com, the website, and we are lucky I downloaded close to 845 images in 2009 because after I released Moon Rising, when you now go to mapaplanet.com, the full color photos of some of the most revealing and important areas have been tampered with and the colors are distorted or overexposed. I urge you to go to mapaplanet.com and click on the natural color link of the moon and start exploring it in full color for yourself. There is more to our moon than meets the eye. In full color you have depth of field, 
and can see the anomalies right before your very eyes. I used to have to explain why the moon appears gray from Earth many, many times. Luckily, an amateur astronomer from Richmond, Texas, decided to take the initiative and find out if, in fact, the moon is full of color. I got real interested in color whenever I saw the Jose's film called Moon Rising. I mean, that inspired me big time. After Bill Bryson viewed my film Moon Rising, he was determined to find out whether or not there was something to what I had presented in that movie. His results have become what will be the future of astronomy. No longer will amateur and in some cases professional astronomers have to become part of the perpetual myth about the moon's true essence. Even in these early photographs taken during the Russian Zand missions, before the Apollo missions took place, they reveal that the moon is a full color celestial body. While going through hundreds of photographs of the moon that have anomalies in them, this one particular photo really stood out. This is AS17-150-23085. A high resolution color photograph taken by the Apollo 17 Hasselblad cameras in 1972. Looking at this photo at first glance doesn't reveal much. This is because it was published upside down and the exposure has been tampered with in order to make details hard to see. By turning the photo right side up, we can now start working on it. First of all, we reset the contrast levels in order to get rid of that brightness. It was taken in color, so we make adjustments to bring back most of the color that had been washed out. Zooming into the landscape, we see what appears to be a giant structure or a machine leaning against the rim of the crater. There is a tentacle-like tubing or wiring connected to it, and there's also an opening where part of it is cut away. Surveying the crater along the edge, there is another object that is round and appears to also have tubing connected to it. Further inside the crater toward the bottom area, there appears to be a large self-illuminating glow. After researching this particular photo, I needed to find its location. I downloaded the Apollo Mission 17 Lunar Photography Index Map and by overlaying a section of the full-color Clementine Moon Map and stretching it to match the index map, I was able to pinpoint the exact position of the crater. I found out the name of the crater is Lobachevsky, named after Nikolai Lobachevsky, a Russian mathematician who is known as the Copernicus of geometry. So I then went back to Map a Planet and zoomed in on this area and downloaded the crater where this object is resting. Sure enough, there it is. Looking at it from this aerial view, we have a different perspective of the structure. The Lobachevsky crater is 84 kilometers in diameter, or 52 miles. This makes the size of this structure at least 10 miles wide and about 6 miles high from the bottom floor of the crater. We can see the bright glow that we detected towards the bottom of the crater is still burning or glowing even after 22 years since the Apollo 17 photo was taken in December 1972. From this vantage point, we can see another bright glow with what appears to be a bluish-white smoke coming out of the top of the fire. We can also see that the round object seen here at the 9 o'clock position of the crater still appears to be a round structure of some kind leaning on the ridge of the crater. The reason I feel that glow to the left of the object might be cutting away the rim of the crater is because to the right of the structure there's a perfectly cut section that was not evident in the Apollo 17 photo 22 years earlier. I found another version of Lobachevsky photographed by Apollo 16 in April 1972. This photo is AS16-121-19407 and this is what we found out which is interesting. This section where the object is resting in the Apollo 17 photo looks like it's being excavated. You can even see a tower or a column shaped like a cross at the top right in the center of the excavation. There is also a tunnel opening in what appears to be a gray or metallic mound. A close-up of the crater taken by the Clementine mission in 1994 appears like it has been expanded. You can still see the tower or column in the entryway of whatever this structure is. If you look closely at it, 
you can see more tentacle-like tubing or wiring on the outside of the crater. This is an amazing aerial view of the structure that is still there. At least we know someone started excavating for the building of this structure in April of 1972, and we saw more of this strange object in its building stages within eight months of the excavation. Here it is in 1994, and the object is still there serving some purpose for someone in this crater. We are fortunate to have this proof that there is something there, and we are witness to something that has been constructed on the lunar surface at the edge of this crater. We know that someone, or should I say something, built this. I got started in this probably in the mid-1990s, listening to Hoagland on the old Coast to Coast AM radio program with Art Bell. And uh, he was talking about the stuff that he'd found on the moon. And some images and some things that clearly uh, appeared to be structures, they were very anomalous. And uh, he was noting that there were thousands upon thousands of photographs that had been taken of the moon by the various unmanned probes and then the astronauts that had orbited the moon. And he said, you know, Art, anybody can do this. And what I realized is, A, I'm anybody. B, I think I understand the arguments. Um, I'm an engineer by trade, so an uh, aerospace engineer. So I, uh, I may not be an architect, but I certainly know structure when I see it. And I started looking at the evidence that he presented, and I just got fascinated by it. I created a web page called the uh, Lunar Anomalies homepage, which still exists. And it was all dedicated to stuff on the moon. The Hubble telescope has taken the most incredible photography of deep space and far off in the vast universe. When you see these spectacular scenes, you can't help but wonder how many others live out there. So when NASA was asked by scientists and astronomers when the Hubble telescope would be used in photographing the moon, NASA's reply was that because the moon was too bright, it would be impossible to get accurate photography of the moon. The first photo was released from the Hubble Space Telescope in 1999. Needless to say, the scientists and astronomers were not too pleased at how NASA had deliberately lied to them. When I heard about this photograph, I thought for sure we would see the moon in full color. But of all the photos taken by the Hubble telescope of the moon, they are in black and white. Prepare yourself for an incredible expedition as we now take you back to the moon on a voyage filled with mystery and secrecy. I'm not sure why NASA has not told us what's on the moon. Um, in a way they have told us because the pictures are there and there's hundreds of them. So anybody can do what I did and go and look at the pictures and, and enlarge them and, and see what there is. NASA has been there, uh, but we haven't been back since 1972. And you kind of sit there and wonder why uh, that is. Um, it's our closest celestial neighbor in the heavens. You can see it every night when you walk outside, and, and really there's, there's so much mystery about it still to this day. Many people seem to think that the Apollo program answered a lot of these questions, and in many ways it did, but we, the general public, have never been privy to any of those answers. Is there already somebody there? And is there even a secret space program that we don't know about, that maybe even NASA doesn't know about, that's been to the moon and back and using very advanced technology? Uh, a cover story that's based entirely upon the premise that there is absolutely no life there, um, and that there's no life to be found, past, present, at all. That's simply not the case. So I certainly believe that some of the stuff that we're finding on the moon may be alien, extraterrestrial in origin. It may be ruined, ancient, abandoned extraterrestrial ruins. Some of it may be active, and some of it, in fact, may be our own stuff. I don't think there's any possibility that NASA is not aware of the civilizations on the moon and the structures. They're very obvious, easy to see. They are in contact with some of these uh, extraterrestrial life forms. Um, 
and they don't want you to know about it. There was the guy that hacked into the uh, NASA database and found some listings of non-terrestrial officers. NASA may have made a deal with beings up there to not reveal their civilization, but then again, the pictures have the evidence. It's all in the pictures anyway. The, the whole purpose to the cover-up is to prevent we, the plebeian masses of this planet, from gaining the appreciation that there is indeed extraterrestrial life out there, intelligent extraterrestrial life. And this is life that the government is very well aware of. The governments of around the world, it's certainly not a U.S. issue. Uh, they're very well aware of it. Because you've been lied to, you've been robbed of something that you deserve, which is to know what your true history is and what your true significance is in this world. I really don't think people realize how deep the lie goes, um, how big it is, how unbelievable the cover-up is. This truly is the greatest story ever denied. It is the most amazing secret never told. It is the most monumental cover-up in human history. And hopefully, the public will take a movie like this and will begin to open up some doors, begin to open up some windows to the truth, whether it's from the government, uh, whether it's from other insiders who can now come forward and begin to tell their stories of what they did uh, and their involvement in this cover-up uh, to get the truth out there. I think the world's ready for it. Um, and hopefully a movie like this will, will push that forward a little bit and speed the process up. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. By playing around with these images, uh, using modern software techniques, um, some of the results really are eye-opening. And again, it really comes back to, you've got to ask yourself the question, why do NASA or any of the other space agencies or any of the major observatories, why will they not show you any of the new adaptive optics imagery of the moon? They simply won't show it to you. They don't have any, they claim. A report was prepared under contract to NASA by the Brookings Institute, Washington, DC. The report outlines the need to investigate the possible social consequences of an extraterrestrial discovery and to consider whether such a discovery should be kept from the public in order to avoid political change and a possible devastating effect on scientists themselves due to the discovery that many of their own most cherished theories could be at risk. And it says in there that you should seriously consider covering that information up because it may in fact lead to what it calls the disintegration of our culture because of the tremendous cultural impact, the shock that it would have, especially to scientists and engineers who think, who've come to believe arrogantly, I think, that we are the top of the heap, that we are some part of some natural process and we are the dominant species. I don't think that that argument flies. I think that document is nothing more than their political and legal cover for what they've been doing. Because there is a much bigger issue that comes out here. 
What most people don't know is that you know NASA is not a civilian science agency. If you look at the actual charter under which NASA was uh, originally put into existence, it states clearly there that NASA is an adjunct, a division of the Department of Defense, and it is beholden to the Department of Defense. When you couple the Brookings Institute report with a document called Executive Order 10501, uh, 10501 was a document that was specifically related to safeguarding official information in the interests of national defense. And it's important to note that the term national defense actually includes not only considerations of a military perspective, but also geoeconomic and geopolitical as well. Um, and when you compare or take those two documents, when you take 10501 and the Brookings Institute report, Right there, that lays the framework for the greatest story ever denied. That gives them legal justification to cover this up. It has been speculated the moon missions were hoaxed. Perhaps some of the Apollo missions were filmed in different locations and in studios in order to conceal the incredible discoveries found on the moon. In 1979, Marie Chatelain, former chief of NASA Communications Systems, confirmed Neil Armstrong had indeed reported seeing two UFOs on the rim of a crater. The encounter was common knowledge at NASA, he revealed, but nobody has talked about it until now. If you, even if you don't care what's up there, you damn sure care about the lies that are being put in place to hide what's up there. You know, whether you have the interest in the space program or the interest in, in what's going on over our planet's atmosphere or not, you are affected by the lies that are in place to maintain this greatest of all cover-ups. And we're talking about uh, just a massive effort by the military-industrial complex. A couple of nuclear weapons sent into space were destroyed by the extraterrestrials. Our government sent a nuclear weapon for explosion on the moon's surface. It was tended to, as I understand it, to assess some scientific data and reaction and so forth. When I was a corporate manager of Fairchild Industries in 1974 through 77, I met the late Dr. Werner von Braun in early 74. At that time, Von Braun was dying of cancer, but he assured me that he would live a few more years in order to tell me about the game that was being played, that game being the effort to weaponize space. The idea of any explosion in space by any Earth government was not acceptable to the extraterrestrials, and that has been demonstrated over and over. The strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was that first the Russians are going to be considered to be the enemy. In fact, when I met him in 74, they were the enemy. They wanted a weapon system they could put in space that would stop a ballistic missile. That was the concept. Then terrorists would be identified, and that was soon to follow. We heard a lot about terrorism, 
Now, if that ballistic missile happened to be coming from another direction other than earthbound, could it do the same thing? Then we were going to identify third world country crazies. We now call them nations of concern. I have but a short time to try to convince people that we are moving in an avenue where we are going to militarize space. The next enemy was asteroids. And the funniest one of all was against what he called aliens, extraterrestrials. That would be the final card. As a direct result, we will become a threat to them unless we spiritually grow also. And over and over and over, during the four years that I knew him, he would bring up that last card. And remember, Cal, the last card is the alien card. We're going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens. And all of it, he said, is a lie. We put nuclear weapons out in space as a line of defense. And we was ready to blow them up if they started in. Today, most people have come to the very clear realization, I think, that things aren't quite as you've been told. And the question then just becomes is, how big is the lie? And the truth is, it's bigger than most people can imagine. One of the great things about the NASA archive system is that at the back of many of their documents, they have both distribution and reference lists. And the distribution lists are very important. They say who that document is being forwarded to and which department and for what company. Uh, and when you begin to cull through these documents, certainly ones that deal with specific subject matter, like image enhancement, for example, you begin to see a lot of names that obviously begin to repeat. And you can very quickly determine what individuals knew what and had to have been privy to certain information just by the very nature of their job. The individual that I managed to uh, identify and who agreed to meet with me and talk with me was a man who worked for a company called Bellcom during the 1960s and into the early 1970s. Bellcom, although many people haven't heard of it, is in many ways a company that is more responsible for landing man on the moon than NASA really was. Uh, Bellcom's a division of AT&T and Western Electric. Uh, Bellcom was around for only a decade. They were there sp for, for the specific purpose of, of landing man on the moon and ensuring that NASA got the job done. Meeting him was actually the, the, the most incredible three hours of my life, this, the interview that we had. Um, a man who I knew was in the know, a man who I'd tracked down. He wasn't in any, in any way looking to, to throw this stuff out in the public eye. Um, it was just really a matter of him recognizing that I wasn't on a total blind fishing expedition and I'd actually figured some things out. That opened him up in a big way. He made the comment several times during the interview that he'd never talked about this with anyone before. It was not the kind of subject matter that you talk with anyone about. The, the people that were in a position to be in the know, to, to have at least some high level of understanding of what was really going on, uh, these individuals are also very well aware of what their government is actually capable of. A guard told me that he was asked to burn some photographs and not to look at them. And there was a guard, another guard guarding him, who was in green fatigues, watching him burn the photographs. And he said he was too tempted. He looked at one, and it was a picture of a UFO. And he was very descriptive. I can go into that later with anyone. Uh, he immediately was hit in the head, and he had a big gash in his forehead. He was knocked out, and he's terrified. So he would have to be protected. Uh, another incident, I knew someone in quarantine with the Apollo astronauts. He told me that the Apollo astronauts saw craft on the moon when we landed. And that is what he told me. And he also was afraid, he said, that the astronauts are told to keep this quiet. They're not allowed to talk about it. So I do want to let you know that I worked out there for a number of years, and this I ran into this. So it's not something everyone knows that works out there for a long time. My boss didn't know about it. Uh, some people that sat right next to me didn't know about it. It's, it's very strange because I don't know how they can do it, but they can let some people know about it and then others not. I'm willing to testify before Congress that what I'm saying is true, and uh, thank you very much. They know the power of these people. A lot of people ask questions like, well, how come none of these people who knew about it have ever come forward? Uh, these individuals have signed their lives away in security classification uh, documents. And when I say sign their lives away, I mean that quite literally. I mean, these are things that if they talk about, it's off to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, this is 
the greatest secret in not only the United States military and the United States government, but around the world. So really for a lot of these individuals, and there are many other uh, investigators out there who will tell you this, that one of the only ways these individuals have to ever put the truth out is to do it through a proxy. Uh, they find another individual or another individual finds them and they talk a little bit about what they know. They're usually very, very careful when they talk about it because they don't want trails leading right back to them. Um, with this gentleman, I think uh, a great deal of his openness had to do with the fact that um, he, he knew he was dying and he knew that uh, he was just fed up with the government's behavior. So uh, he was more than willing, knowing that I had understood at least a little bit of what was going on, he was much more willing to open up to me. On November 20th, 1969, the Apollo 12 astronauts did an experiment with some strange results. They crashed the lunar module ascent stage into the surface of the moon. Shockwaves reverberated throughout the moon for over an hour. Some have likened this to ringing like a bell. These results were repeated during the Apollo 13 mission. However, this time the shockwaves lasted for over three hours. Hollow Moon researchers say that this is proof that the interior of the moon was hollowed out by artificial means. MIT's Dr. Sean C. Solomon wrote, the lunar orbiter experiments vastly improved our knowledge of the moon's gravitational field, indicating the frightening possibility that the moon might be hollow. On March 7, 1971, instruments placed on the moon by the Apollo astronauts recorded a cloud of water vapor passing over the surface. The event lasted for over 14 hours and covered an area of at least 100 square miles. The Earth is thought to be around 4.6 billion years old, while rocks from the moon were found to be around 5.3 billion years old, and the dust the rocks were found in is thought to be about a billion years older than that. This information conflicts with the theory that the moon was produced by a collision the Earth had with another body earlier in its history. Uh, one of the things that you've, you've got to keep in mind as well when you're looking at NASA imagery is that uh, although the sky may appear black in those frames, in many instances, when you enhance that image, you discover that there's actually an incredible amount of image detail that's just buried in the darkness of that image. Uh, but when you amplify that scene and you begin to see what's hidden there in the sky, you can begin to make out shapes. There's a few images that show structuring. Um, and this is all done in an effort to both hide the truth, but as well to leave a bit of the truth there for you. And again, a lot of people don't want to believe they do that, but they do. Uh, that's all part of the dripping faucet technique, where they give you tiny little bits of the truth and you can begin to fill it in, fill it, put it together for yourself. One of the frames that really, really demonstrates the way they use this dripping faucet technique is a frame known as uh, 20680 from the Apollo 17 mission. For 30 years, this frame was listed, officially listed in their catalogs in the Apollo 17 photographic index as being a blank, no image data frame, a frame that has got nothing on it. Um, while this image is most definitely sunstruck and overexposed, uh, blank it most certainly is not. Harrison Schmidt, you know, created some patches uh, for his own mission, Apollo 17, which is again the mission that we take this image from, these images from, and uh, that we've seen a lot of this color effect. And uh, what he put on it was Stonehenge and uh, the sun. And the sun is a symbol of ancient Egyptian god Horus. It's there's all sorts of Egyptian mythology that runs through all the Apollo program, which is supposed to be Greek, but it ends up that there's really sort of a dual meaning to all this stuff, and it's an Egyptian. And what he's saying is, what he's clearly saying to people is, look, these are ruins. There, there is structure. That, this is what we're really doing on the moon. And I think what they're doing is they're trying in a subtle way to let people know, either because they remember it subconsciously or because um, they are deliberately trying to send us messages under the radar that they did not go there 
and pick up a bunch of rocks. But instead, what they brought back or what they were sent to investigate was ancient extraterrestrial ruins. One of the most important things to keep in mind whenever you're looking at any NASA imagery, whether it's Apollo imagery uh, or, or imagery of Mars, it doesn't really matter. Perspective is everything. Uh, we human beings down here on terra firma are, are afforded one perspective of the moon. We look at it and that's what we have to look at. We, we don't know what the moon looks like from the side uh, or, or from different oblique angles. All we have is this singular representation that we have to look at. And NASA has in fact gone to great lengths to ensure that the imagery that they show us of the moon's surface um, resembles very closely both in, in photometric uh, function as well as uh, in, in angling and, and the dimensional properties of the image make it appear as if it would look just like it does from Earth. One of the primary obfuscation techniques that NASA uses is to simply rotate the imagery. Uh, they insert a false horizon in their oblique imagery, so by turning these images upside down, uh, it, it, it alters vertical objects, suddenly don't cast shadows anymore, the shadows aren't in the right places. Um, and, and this technique has been used since the, the dawn of the space age, um, since the lunar orbiter missions, since even before that with Ranger missions, uh, to make things appear as we humans expect them to appear because we look through a telescope here, we say, oh, that's how it looks. So from the side, it probably looks like this. Uh, the reality is it, it, it doesn't. Uh, the moon is a very three-dimensional object. Hasselblad cameras were the ones that were used by NASA to photograph everything on the moon. And the reason the Hasselblad was used is because they had registration crosshairs. Now these registration crosshairs are there for a specific reason, okay? They're so that you can take a single photo with a single camera, so you'll be able to get distance from an object to another object because of the registration crosshairs that are built into the Hasselblad cameras. These crosshairs are always in front of whatever's being photographed. Okay, this is a perfect shot of a photograph of one of the astronauts on the moon. Now here you see the crosshairs from the Hasselblad camera, okay? You can clearly see that they are even in the darkness of space, but you can clearly see that the crosshairs are there in exactly the positions they should be. So in a lot of the false horizons, they've eliminated the crosshairs in the sky parts. And almost about 90% of the moon shots have what we call a false horizon. In 1999, William Burroughs uh, wrote a book called This New Ocean. It's a non-fictional account, supposedly non-fictional account, uh, of the space race. If you look at the cover of that book, you'll notice that he has a picture of the Earth's horizon on it with the moon above. And on the cover of this book, there are two black running parallel lines that climb up from the Earth and they pass the moon on either side, paralleling it. It's interesting when you go and look at the ISS and space shuttle imagery of the moon from low Earth orbit. Uh, when you begin to enhance those images and uh, begin to attack the black area of the sky that appears to be solid black, um, and there, there, there are different filtering techniques you can use to draw that, that out, um, you begin to realize that those lines that are on the cover of his book actually are appearing in these photographs. And they don't appear once or twice, you don't see this effect once or twice, you see this in many, many, many dozens of photographs. You just, they're just of the moon. 
they appear when you enhance the image. And obviously Burroughs knows something that the public's not privy to. Uh, he's really just a classic outsider insider, very much like Andrew Chaikin is. He's a guy who knows what the truth is, but has agreed to perpetuate the lie rather than to reveal what the truth is uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Burroughs does a fantastic job of presenting to us exactly the, the propaganda and the storyline that the powers that be have been selling us as being the truth for decades. And it gives the reader the official historical cover story in brilliant details. He's someone who is, is most definitely in the know. There are also frames in which some of these lines appear to be behind the moon, where you see the line rising up and being cut off as it hits the, the lower limb of the moon before re-emerging again on the exact opposite side of that interception point where it continues on its very straight linear path. Uh, and in these cases, you can see that the lines do not transit in front of or across the lunar disk, but rather it's the opposite. The moon appears to be transiting and covering these lines. So wh what's going on here? Why do all these NASA ISS frames of the moon taken from LEO show these these parallel lines and why does why does this book cover mimic this this same visual? What are we seeing and, and what is being represented? One hypothesis I've heard uh, has to do with what are called space elevators, which as the name implies are elevator transport systems that can be used to lift things, satellites, cargo, spacecraft, people, from the surface of the earth, lift those up into space. Now, yeah, I realize that to many people, this idea of building elevators with lengths of the tens of thousands of kilometers that could extend from the Earth's surface up to geostationary orbit or to the moon uh, probably sounds ludicrous, something that, if it is possible at all, must be centuries and centuries beyond what we're capable of doing today. But it really does not seem to be as beyond state-of-the-art as one might think. These are the kind of projects being worked on today and funded today. Back in 1999, NASA sponsored what was called the Space Elevator Workshop, uh, and its purpose was to explore the feasibility of the development of space elevators in the 21st century. And it, it discusses plans for construction that would take place during during the later half of this century. Uh, and, and that's all the unclassified stuff. That is what they're willing to tell us about their capabilities. Were the Egyptian pharaohs and clergymen of their time aware of subterranean places that had celestial functions? Judging by hieroglyphics that were discovered in tombs of pharaohs such as Ramses, one can see a collaboration between what the Egyptians described in their time as a stairway to heaven and what we are seeing now with these space elevators emanating from Earth. The Vector, NASA's official logo. If you've ever looked at NASA's official logo, both their, their official insignia and their official seal, you'll see that the most prominent object in the, in the seal is a, a red swooshing object. They call that the Chevron or the Vector. If you ask NASA's public affairs office that this symbology is featured so heavily in their insignia and seal, they'll give you what really amounts to the, the standard facile cover story for the unilluminated. They'll tell you that that is uh, a representation of a hypersonic wing design from the 1950s, um, which was the time the logo was created. Um, not exactly the case. Um, someone might want to ask the Russian Federal Space Agency, Roscosmos, that was formed in 1992, why they chose that same logo. And while you're at it, you can go ask the Chinese, who formed their space agency in 1996, why in the world they're using a hypersonic wing design from the 1950s as their official logo. Then you can ask the Japanese, the South Koreans, Taiwanese, Malaysia, Mexico, Iran, all of these countries, even Bulgaria. They all utilize the vector symbology in their space agency logos for their, their national space agencies. Um, it gets even deeper. You can go look at the individual manned program patches for NASA. Now, the Mercury program, for example, uh, a blatant use of covert symbology in every logo dealing with the Mercury program, you'll see what looks like a number seven in their logo. And again, NASA's official story is that they put this number seven there so that they could pay homage to the original seven Mercury astronauts. Um, kind of forgetting the fact that only six Mercury astronauts actually flew into space because number seven never, never did. Deke Slayton had a heart problem, so he, he didn't get to go up. 
Uh, so there were only six Mercury <laughs> astronauts, yet there's a seven in every single logo. That's in the official mission and say or official program insignia for Mercury, as well as the six individual mission patches carry this logo. And it carries on to the space shuttle program. If you look at the Apollo logo, the Apollo logo has a big letter A in it. At least that's what they want you to believe, but it's not. Again, that's just a simple way of explaining away the inclusion of this vector symbology in the logo. If you go to the space shuttle program, uh, the original space shuttle STS program patch is a triangular patch that, again, hides the use of the chevronic vector symbology. And that also goes for many of the STS-specific mission patches. Uh, every single one of the International Space Station expedition patches carry the vector symbology. The Russian Mir Space Station used the vector symbology. That was their, their official logo. You can even go deeper and look at military industrial complex companies. Look at the logo on a company like Lockheed Martin, two vectors. Um, the XPRIZE logo, Ames Research Labs, U.S. Space Command, when you get into the military realm, the United States Space Command, their official logo is the vector symbol. And when you look at the military's individual space-specific programs, all of them, all of them deal with vector symbology and their official insignias. And the, the question really becomes, who or what are these people paying homage to? And the truth, quite frankly, is out of this world. This painting entitled The Madonna with Saint Giovannino was made sometime during the 1400s. The artist's name is not known, but at first glance you can notice a UFO shape in the sky to the right side of the Madonna. If you were to see the original full-size painting, you would see the object clearly. Looking at the enlargement, you can see a man and his dog standing and looking up at the object. However, this painting has something else being depicted. On the left side of the painting, you see the sun and some vector-like objects seemingly flying from or toward the sun. Perhaps this artist was trying to tell us something. In another painting of the Madonna made by a completely different artist, the unusual patterns of the sun and the vector-like symbols have also been added prominently on the Madonna's cloak. You can see the same symbology on this painting as on the one before. This time, however, there is no UFO object to be seen anywhere in the sky. This footage was taken over Mexico City in 2002. There were many other videos and photographs taken of this same type of object clearly resembling the shapes as seen on the visor of the astronaut, on the moon, and depicted in the 14th century paintings of the Madonna and Child. There is probably a larger story behind the vectors, but it is very unusual this symbology has been adapted by all the United States and foreign space agencies, especially enemies like Iran and others who are also making missions to the moon. Now to the voice of Jim Level. 560.5, good to hear your voice. Uh, Paul 8, Houston, uh, what does the old moon look like from 60 miles, over? Okay, uh, Houston, the moon is essentially gray, no color. It's so unbelievably beautiful. All these natural colors that exist out there, 
has never been shown to us. I've seen on TV, the moon is gray and black, and there, it has no color. Well, that couldn't be farther from the truth. It's, it's really, it, it's compelling. I, I just want to see more, and it, it's, it blew me away. It absolutely blew me away. First of all, with the Clementine mission, it took 1.8 million images of the moon. Um, the high resolution ones, you can't seem to get any of them because, well, they give you different reasons why you can't get them, but you can't seem to get them. But there's also these natural color images, and they, and they are much, much brighter. They have far more color than they should if our models of the moon are correct. Now, there's two ways you can approach this. One is it could very well be that some of these areas, let's say some of these areas under these glass structures, these domes, are still intact, that there's still atmosphere in there, that there is still stuff growing there. You know, you would obviously have plants and vegetation, you have various things there that you would need to survive or that you would have simply for the aesthetics of living in an environment with, um, with plants and animals. So it's possible that's what some of this stuff is. Another distinct possibility, and this is the one that I tend to advocate, is that if you really do have these multiple layers of glass structures all over the moon, what's going to happen is, is the light is going to scatter and bounce all over the place. And when it does that, you get a prism effect and it then will combine with other red or green or blue and it will make other colors. In order to comprehend the significance about the natural color of the moon, you need to know where these images come from. This is what is called the skin of the moon. It is the actual surface that has been stretched and flattened out. When visual artists wrap this skin around a sphere in their 3D programs, this is what you get. Jose Escamilla downloaded hundreds of sections of the entire skin that is available on the USGS website. The area of interest is in this section here, located on the front side of the moon. When Jose zoomed into this particular section, he recognized some very unusual features and objects in the scene. First of all, the terrain below is clearly presenting itself at an angular view. The disk shape located here appears to be hovering above the surface. When you compare this disk with others that are closer to the terrain, you can clearly see this object is not down on the terrain. Jose found out very quickly that there are more of these disks all over the moon. The disks that you will see in other photos we are going to present are identical to this one. They are hovering on their sides and sometimes they are hovering as these others below. The other disks you will see are different in color and details, but they are shining light onto the lunar surface as they do whatever they are doing close to the terrain. In all the photos Jose presents in this film, you are seeing the only clear and detailed photography ever released in full color of real flying saucers. NASA has known this and so have the multitudes of people connected to the space program. Another thing that I need to bring forth is in my first film, UFO The Greatest Story Ever Denied, we had this whole segment on the STS footage of the things that are flying near the tether, things that have the donut hole, but they seem to be alive. I come to find out that these things are thriving on the moon's surface. There's thousands of them, and they're hovering above the moon's surface, finding the full color imagery that you're looking at now, the natural colors of the moon. It brings us to a total new reality that the moon could have been teeming with life back in 94 when these photos were taken, or it may still be teeming with life.
And the truth is, once you look at these pictures of the moon or Mars, and you realize that this stuff is structure, that there's artificial structures there, uh, pretty much everything is on the table. There are so many lunar landscapes filled with color and textures unlike anything ever seen before with the human eye. There are deep crevices and overhangs where you can see immensely huge openings or what appear to be cavern entrances. There are far too many gigantic and massive structures as can be described. You have to see them for yourself in order to grasp the size of these complex and in most cases alien-like architecture as you have seen in many films. You will even see some strange vine-like webbing as depicted in Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds. Glass domes, UFOs, massive buildings and scaffolding spread throughout the lunar terrain in many sizes, shapes, and forms. It is evident the missions to the moon were more involved than gathering rocks and dirt samples. There is no doubt we went to the moon. It is what was waiting for us when we got there that this film is about. Finding the full color imagery that you're looking at now, the natural colors of the moon, it brings us to a total new reality that the moon could have been teeming with life back in 94 when these photos were taken, or it may still be teeming with life. I think they are still there. They were there in the, in the 70s when the last Apollo mission was there. I found lights on. It seems that at least in some areas of the moon that the lights might still be on. Uh, we're talking about the covering up of hyper-advanced technology that could do away with fossil fuels, uh, our dependence on fossil fuels. Um, we're talking about uh, technology that allows for much quicker transport through space than, than we've ever been told. What I think has happened is that all these other countries somehow have found out that we went there, that we brought back this technology, that we're exploiting this technology and um, they want a piece of the action. So that's why, it's the only reason why they would spend the kind of money that they're spending, India, China, all these, Japan, all these countries to go back to the moon, to what, to collect rocks? No, they're going back there because there's something incredibly valuable there that they know that we have, the United States brought back, that they want a piece of. And it's, it's a tremendous risk. You know, there's, there's not just simply the risk to the astronauts' lives, there's, if you believe some of the stories, there's even a risk to, uh, you know, other people that might already be there. In the end result, I have found that the moon is in full color. It's not a black and white object. It's not made of, uh, you know, impact craters and this kind of thing. There's a lot more to it. NASA has deliberately tampered a lot of the photography. They've eliminated the crosshairs to eliminate what was in the background in the sky or in the, in the landscapes and there are some very significant things that have occurred. All we say, we don't know the answers. You know, in this whole realm, none of us, none of these individual researchers, not necessarily Jose, not Richard and I, not, we don't have all the answers. Various, we all have a piece of the puzzle. We all see different parts of it, and there's certain aspects of this that we're all good at. All I'm presenting to you, and it's backed up with facts, all my films present you with evidence that is fully acknowledged. You can backtrace it, you can do as they say, back engineer everything I present. It's all there for you to see. What we do know is that 
there's more information out there. Again, there's 1.8 million Clementine images sitting on the web. No one person can access even a handful of those and look at them and study them and find stuff on them. So what we need is for people that see these films and see documentaries like this is to understand that this stuff does exist. They can't hide it all. When I was talking with a gentleman from Belcom and, and we were discussing uh, the lie, everything he was telling me was different from what we were being told uh, was the truth. And at one point I asked him, I said, man, you, you guys, you, you lied about a lot, didn't you? And instantly he said, no, we didn't lie about certain things. We lied about everything. None of it was true.
have vowed that we shall not see it governed by a hostile flag of conquest, but by a banner of freedom and peace. We have vowed that we shall not see space filled with weapons of mass destruction, but with instruments of knowledge and understanding. Yet the vows of this nation can only be fulfilled if we in this nation are first, and therefore we intend to be first.